Well, good afternoon. We're going to call this hearing to order. We have a number of colleagues that will be joining this as they do what we always do, trying to juggle and be in two or three places at once. Um, and uh, I've always said, I wish I could do beam me up Scotty, and then maybe we could just go back and forth on all the important things that are happening. So we will have a number of colleagues joining us. Very much appreciate uh, all of your uh, coming and sharing information and, and to have such a distinguished panel. Uh, and uh, some of you have traveled long ways, and so we're, we're very, very grateful for your willingness to join us today and uh, for a very, very serious conversation about what's happening in terms of the GOP's tax giveaway plan, which we are very concerned will hurt families, seniors, and uh, middle class. And I'm also very pleased to have our distinguished leader on the Finance Committee, uh, Senator Ron Wyden, as co-chair of the event. And Senator Wyden has been involved in a number of tax reform proposals that are thoughtful and bipartisan. And I'm confident that if there, there is a willingness to reject the approach being talked about now and instead move to a bipartisan approach that we can do something that really will grow the economy and create jobs uh, and help small businesses and close the tax loopholes sending jobs overseas, which for us in Michigan is an incredibly important issue, and also put more money in the pockets of middle class families in Michigan and across the money across the country. And uh, looking at Max Richmond here, we also want to say whatever we do, we want to make sure we're protecting Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. So this can be done right in a thoughtful way that uh, grows jobs and makes sure we're competitive internationally and uh, closes loopholes and at the same time helps the people uh, who have not received uh, the big tax cuts and benefits of other proposals. So we want to put money in the pockets of middle-income families and are anxious to uh, get your thoughts on what works and what doesn't work. Too often we think of tax policy in terms of sterile numbers on a spreadsheet. In reality, tax policy is about people. It's about our priorities and our values. And unfortunately, the Republican tax giveaway plan suggests that they care the most about people who are part of the wealthiest 1% of Americans. We're still waiting for our House of Representatives colleagues to put out their final plan. We understand it may be tomorrow morning now. Uh, and Senate Republicans are just getting started on their version. But both of them, we know, are based on a framework that has been publicly released. And some of us have been in conversations at the White House as well around a framework uh, that goes something like this. Uh, bottom line of what we've seen, it would raise taxes on middle-income families. In Michigan, about 30 percent of the families would actually get a tax increase, which I had to look twice to say, is, is that right here, as folks are talking about a tax reform plan. We know that it, the strategy, the framework, is focused on providing another huge tax giveaway to the wealthiest 1 percent under the theory that it will trickle down and that everyone will benefit. We also know that the reality is it will explode the deficit and threaten Social Security and Medicare. Instead of honest bipartisan work on tax reform that we all support, that cuts taxes for middle class families and helps businesses of all sizes create jobs, what we're seeing from Republicans uh, is the same old trickle-down nonsense that has failed over and over again. Uh, and let me stress, I'm for whatever it works. If it worked, I'd be here supporting it. We just have evidence, overwhelming evidence to the contrary, including 
today looking at how this approach has actually worked in Kansas as well as nationally. We'll be hearing from two Kansans who lived through and fought back against the hurtful cuts that came from this trickle-down scheme and how a majority of Republicans and Democrats in the Kansas State Legislature stood up to the governor and repealed the harmful tax giveaways in 2016 under great pressure from Kansas citizens. Now, unfortunately, congressional Republicans are trying to take the same failed Kansas plan national. They want to give, as I said, big tax giveaways to billionaires, pretend that there's economic growth that will make up for it, and uh, instead what we know is in jeopardy are our children in schools and communities and our national defense. I'll be the first one to say that we need tax reform. Our tax code is too complicated. And we need to close tax loopholes that are sending our jobs overseas. And again, put more money in the pockets of working families. However, we know that trickle down doesn't work. That approach is a bad deal. I know for the people of Michigan, was for the people of Kansas, and I believe for the people across this country. As proposed, we would see 80% of the benefits go to the top 1% of Americans. We would see important tax incentives for small businesses and manufacturers eliminated, and we would see a bigger debt. So at this point, uh, we know there's a better way to do this. I believe that Americans deserve a better deal, and that's why we're here today. So thank you very, very much for joining us. And I want to thank uh, Senator Maggie Hassan from the great state of New Hampshire for joining us. And before introducing our panel, uh, I'd like to ask Senator Ron Wyden for comments as our leader on the Finance Committee. Well, Senator Stabenow, you are our leader this afternoon, and thank you so much for doing this. And Senator Stabenow has a special gift for finding exactly the right moment to mobilize folks once again. And as of this afternoon, tomorrow in the House, they are going to kick off formally the effort the Senator Stabenow touched on to give trillions of dollars in giveaways to folks at the top paid for by reaching into the pockets of the middle class. And I'm just going to touch on a few of the similarities between what's going on here and in Kansas because Senator Stabenow has said it very well. The first thing I'm struck by is both here and in Kansas, it was clear that they had a big revenue hole. Now, the first bit of history is when you got a hole, you stop digging. But that's not what's going on here. They're not willing to sort of trim some of their promises. They're keeping everything kind of in place in terms of the folks at the top of the top. And then we get all of these reports about how they're going to make it harder for people to save for the 401k. I described it yesterday as a bookkeeper's full employment program because it is so phenomenally complicated and um, bureaucratic. And let's just put down, that down to similarity number one. We got a big revenue hole here, and we had, uh, based on the history for you Kansans, and since I was born in Wichita, we're very glad to see you all here, we've got that uh, in common between Kansas and Washington, D.C. Second, um, there are a lot of false promises made, uh, certainly in Kansas, to the middle class. Senator Stabenow said it very well with respect to trickle down. That is the case, you know, here. We never heard about any of the, well, gee, we're going to make it harder for people to make the initial contribution to their retirement plans. We never heard about any of that. You know, in the in the campaign, we never heard 
about anything that would put Medicare and Medicaid at risk. And I gather in Kansas you got a lot of false promises as well. And then third, and I'm really anxious to hear from the Kansans about this, we have what is really the Grand Canyon of federal tax loopholes being proposed that would basically let uh, people, the high flyers, become what's known as a pass-through firm. And if they're paying like close to 40% on taxes, they get this status, they can pay 25% and get out of paying Social Security and Medicare taxes. And I gather, and I'm very interested in hearing the Kansans explain this, that in Kansas, based on the news reports, a basketball coach figured out a way <coughs> to sort of become a pass-through and get essentially exempt from paying taxes at all. So I see some Kansans nodding, but I'd much rather have you all explain it. And finally, as Senator Stabenow has said, and we said it at the White House, Democrats believe the tax code is broken. It is a broken, dysfunctional mess. <coughs> Got to deal with the uh, inversion of virus. But the way you do this right is the kind of thing that happened when a big group of Democrats got together with Ronald Reagan. So we're very happy that all of you are here. Your timing could not um, be more ideal from the standpoint of you're giving us a story from Kansas and the grassroots about what you shouldn't do and what you should do. Um, and like my colleague, I'm very glad to to see Senator Hassan here, who is the governor, really knows these revenue in issues inside out, and look forward to hearing from all of you. Great. Thank you so much, Senator Wyden. Uh, and again, appreciate over the years your thoughtfulness in putting together bipartisan tax reform plans. So it's something we can do if we want to work together to do it. And, and I hope that eventually we will be able to get to that point. Um, I'm going to introduce everyone, and then we'll ask each of you to take a few moments, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, first of all, Representative Jim Ward from Wichita, Kansas. Thank you so much for uh, traveling here. He is the Democratic Minority Leader in the Kansas State House of Representatives. He helped lead the bipartisan effort to overturn uh, the Kansas uh, tax scheme enacted by Governor Sam Brownback, and we, pre we are looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Sarah LaFrenz Falk, who also is from Kansas, Topeka, Kansas, is a public employee at the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, where, she, where her work focuses on water quality regulations related to feedlots. With my agriculture hat on, I know what that is. So, uh, She's also the proud mother of three elementary school children in Topeka, and uh, again, we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Max Richmond is a former Senate staffer and 16-year veteran of Capitol Hill, no stranger uh, to all of us, currently serves as the president of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. The National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare is an independent nonpartisan organization focused on health care and income security for older Americans. Welcome. Next, we are pleased to have Luce Aravello. Aravallo, am I saying that right? Uh, thank you so much. From Boston, Massachusetts. So welcome. And Luce leads the Low Income Tax uh, Clinic Project as a senior attorney for Greater Boston Legal Services, a 110-year-old organization that provides free legal services, including tax preparation and tax dispute resolution to low-income taxpayers in Massachusetts. And we so much appreciate your work. Uh, next we have, originally from Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, Gene Sperling. Sounds like an athlete's being introduced. I know. Out, out of Michigan, <laughs> That's six, right. Five. Number 23, <laughs> serving as quarterback for you, if I know. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Ball boy. And he was very good at that, actually. So, 
Uh, Gene Sperling served in both the Clinton and Obama administrations as the director of the National Economic Council, leading efforts on several key tax initiatives and is someone who has extensive work in this area, certainly no stranger uh, to all of us. Uh, in his important work. And welcome back, Gene. We're glad to have you. And last but absolutely not least, uh, Bruce Bartlett from Great Falls, Virginia. Bruce Bartlett served as a domestic policy advisor to President Reagan and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy under President George H.W. Bush. He was one of the architects of the 1986 tax reform law under President Reagan is an expert in supply-side economics and how it has worked. Uh, he has written books. Let me, all of a sudden here, I'm missing, uh, authored several books, including his new book, The Truth Matters, A Citizen's Guide to Separating Facts from Lies and Stopping Fake News in Its Tracks. We are very grateful that you are here with us today. So let me start with uh, Representative Ward. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you about the case-setting call at Kansas Tax Experiment. That title wasn't a Democrat title. That's what Governor Brown got <laughs> this experiment. need to ask you to push a button so oh, that second. there you go. All right, let me start over. Thank you for the opportunity to present on the Kansas case study. The governor of Kansas called it a great experiment. While the great experiment was a complete and utter failure that nearly bankrupted our state, it was fiscally irresponsible. It resulted in our credit score being downgraded three times in three years. Annual deficits of about a billion dollars a year, which isn't big numbers for Washington, but in Kansas, that was about a 20% of our, our state general fund. It also was um, caused us to not pay our bills and increase our debt. It was fundamentally unfair. It was the largest tax loophole in the history of our state, resulting in over 330 individuals and businesses, the wealthiest Kansans, paying no state income tax at all. It, we estimate it to be about 330,000 individuals in business, all passed through incomes, royalties, uh, and return on rental properties, uh, the big topics. While that was happening, all the rest of us were paying more taxes, more sales tax, more property tax. They even increased the cost of our car tax and truck tax. While they got big tax cuts, we lost our medical deduction, we lost our child care credit deduction. Our mortgage deduction got cut in half. While we're paying more in taxes, we're getting less when it comes to our schools, our infrastructure, and our public safety. I want to give you a couple of examples. At the school year started this year, we had 1,500 teacher positions open. Teachers are not choosing to stay in Kansas to have a career. We have larger class sizes and programs that help kids who have challenges when they come to school were being cut. Um, school day was being shortened. School weeks were being shortened. Uh, highway projects aren't getting done. Just last week, it was discovered that our agency of children and family that take care of the most vulnerable children in our state lost, lost 74 children who had been placed in their custody. Now, these are children who are severely physically, sexually abused and neglected. We had three prison riots this summer as a result of not being able to hire enough prison guards and officials to supervise them because we don't pay enough. At $13.45 an hour, it's easier to go down the street to Amazon at $15 an hour and have a little better opportunity long term. Denial is a strategy. But it's not a good one. Please don't follow. Look at the case study of Kansas. And the last thing, um, Republicans are great with words, particularly in Kansas. Whenever one of their economic policies failed, they changed the name. You talked about trickle down, and for a while it was supply side. In Kansas, a new word showed up as we talked about this tax experiment, dynamic scoring. What it means is less money. 
Okay. Well, it doesn't mean what they say it does. It means less for more. You get less services and you get more taxes if you are a middle or working class family. I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Less for more. That's what dynamic scoring is. We need to remember that because we are hearing about that now every day. That's the new buzzword is we're not going to really count spending. So we're going to make up uh, wishful thinking on growth. And you're saying less for more. That's important. So, yes, well, we are so pleased to have Miss, uh, Mrs. LaFrance with us. Hi, thank you very much for thank your time. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Sarah LaFrenz, and I'm from Topeka, Kansas. I'm here today as a private Kansas citizen and not as an agent or representative of any of our agencies or agency policies. Thank you for the time and the opportunity to talk to you today about short-sighted tax plans that benefit wealthy corporations but come at a great cost to everyone else. When you drain the public, public coffers for unneeded tax giveaways to the rich, there's not much left for essential public services that benefit all of our citizens. What happened in Kansas is a deeply personal story for me because every single person I know in Kansas has been affected in some way by this tax experiment. As a mother of three, a state employee in Kansas since 2005, and the Kansas Organization of State Employees as a union steward there, I've seen firsthand what this is ex experiment has done to our people. Governor Sam Brownback was elected in November of 2009 on a platform of trickle-down e economics, shrinking government and increasing efficiency. That translated into slashing the tax revenue that our state agencies use to provide vital services to our citizens. And those state services include correctional officers in prisons, social workers, and other vital staff who watch over the kids of Kansas and their families, and environmental regulation and compliance for water quality. And at last count, the state of, of Kansas employee workforce has been reduced by 25%. So that means 25% fewer social workers for vulnerable children, 25% fewer correctional officers to keep order in prisons, 25 fewer percent employees working with environmental regulation and compliance to keep Kansans healthy, and 25 fewer percent Kansas Department of Transportation employees that are maintaining and repairing our roads and bridges. This is a loss that's both unacceptable and preventable. The state of Kansas has had prison riots, as you heard um, Jim talk about here. And these are both related, and they're directly related to the constant and consistent understaffing and inmate overcrowding. In Kansas, the starting pay for a correctional officer is between $14.66 an hour and $15.75 per hour. So that's $30,500 to $32,700 per year, respectively. This job is incredibly demanding and dangerous, and it's compounded by the inability of the state of Kansas to hire and retain officers. At Ellsworth Correctional Facility, four correctional officers are responsible for a cell house of 240 plus inmates. And some correctional facilities, such as Norton Correctional Facility, which was the site of one of these riots, they have cells that are designed for one inmate that are now housing three to four. Because of the lack of staff, the current officers are under mandatory staffing emergency work requirements of up to 18 hour shifts at El Dorado Correctional Facility, which is also a site of one of the riots. Their schedule is currently three 12-hour days and a fourth day of 16 hours. And this so-called emergency is a direct result of starving the corrections facilities of funds because of decreased revenues. There is not enough tax money coming into Kansas to properly allocate funds to prisons to hire enough staff at competitive rates and not enough money to house all the prisoners that we do have in the state of Kansas. And in late September this year, a correctional officer in Kansas committed suicide. And this tragedy was described to our union as directly tied to the extreme stress and long hours of his job. The impact of the reduced revenue is not limited to correctional facilities because in Kansas we're home to, a, to one single reactor nuclear power plant. This is located in Burlington, Kansas, and it's a Wolf Creek generating station. It's been operating since 1985. And as with anything of this kind, it requires maintenance, oversight, and testing to, requir require, or to ensure the people that living near the plant are safe. To that end, um, samples from plants, roadkill, air, and water are taken from the area around Wolf Creek, and these samples are supposed to be tested within the Kansas Health and Environmental Laboratories by their in-house radiochemistry lab. 
This lab is run and maintained by the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, which is another state agency. Currently, that radiochemistry lab is unstaffed. No one works there. The last two people who worked in this lab left in September 2015 due to low pay and rampant mismanagement. And unstaffed for more than two years, no one in Kansas has been testing those samples for radiation. The agency's answer to this problem is to ship what could be potentially radioactive samples to a lab in Coralville, Iowa, using a ground shipping method, and the lab has been doing this, this since September 2015. Given the shipping time of these samples, the potential for shipping delays, and the potential for exceeding the hold time for samples, which would actually compromise the data involved, we really have absolutely no idea whether or not the reactor is leaking into the area surrounding the nuclear power plant. And if there was some sort of emergency, we'd have no idea until it was much too late. And we don't want to forget that all the added costs for shipping and the fact that the people that are shipping these samples might want to know they could possibly contain radioactive isotopes. And the positions for this lab as of Sunday when I was working on some research for this still remain open and they've been repeatedly advertised. And um, at 25.68 per hour for the lab manager and 22.16 for the lab's chemist. So that's $53,414 and it's $46,000 and 93 cents or 46,093 per year respectively. So elsewhere in the country, chemists who do that kind of testing are required to have master's degrees and PhDs. And the going range of pay for a radiochemistry lab manager nationally is eighty to $90,000, and that's at the low end. So because of our budget problems, which have been caused by this tax experiment, we cannot afford to pay valuable and necessary employees at a fair rate of pay, and this puts everyday Kansans at risk. On September 1, 2017, an employee for the Kansas Department of Revenue was shot while at work in the Wichita office. This employee had performed a seizure of assets as a part of his job as a revenue agent that morning. And the person whose assets were seized came into the office that afternoon and shot him multiple times in front of his coworkers. The assailant, the assailant was buzzed in through a locked door after asking to talk to that employee by name. There's no metal detector, there was no security guard, and no screening of any real significance. Previously, the Department of Revenue was housed in the Finney Building in Wichita with armed guards and actual security measures. And the new revenue office that, where he, the shooting took place took, was in a strip mall. As part of Brownback's ongoing efforts to shrink government and increase efficiency, which is not so secret code for privatization of state services, the state of Kansas has moved towards no longer owning or maintaining any buildings, which means that regarding safety, we're all at the mercy of whoever owns the buildings that the state rents. And on September 21st, a state employee nearly paid with his life. And you know, you just heard Jim Ward talk about this children that the Department of Children and Families lost. That story broke on October 10th. The state of Kansas, Kansas literally lost children because we decided to trim spending in that way. So I'm here today to implore you to learn from this failed experiment. Government taxes its citizens so as to responsibly invest in public goods and services that benefit all of us. And when lawmakers decide to starve these public services, people's lives are endangered, harmed irreparably, and sometimes lost altogether. You know, I, I think that when we think about this, we have to think about what kind of people are we? What kind of country are we? Do we leave people behind based on circumstance? Or do we move forward together? And I thank you for this opportunity to share these stories with you. Thank you so very much. Um, Mr. Richman, thank you, Max, uh, for all of your advocacy and work on behalf of seniors and Medicare and Social Security. Thank you. Thank you, Senators, for uh, the opportunity to testify. Before I, I present my statement, I just wanted to say something about Senator Wyden's opening comment when he said that during the campaign we didn't hear anything about limiting contributions to 401ks. That's true. But we did hear a lot about not touching Social Security, not touching Medicare, not touching Medicaid. I think I watched all of the Republican uh, primary debates, which was close to torture, but I watched them. And uh, I heard President, then candidate Trump, say time and again he would not cut Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid. Though that promise is not being kept uh, by this budget uh, that the administration supports. So I'm here today to voice uh, the National Committee's opposition to the Republican budget and the tax plans that we feel will inevitably lead to the unraveling 
of working and middle class programs in order to, in part, uh, pay for massive tax cuts for the very wealthy and profitable corporations. By allowing the federal budget deficit to increase by at least one and a half trillion dollars, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid will become vulnerable to benefit cuts. Now, what's more, as the cost of the tax bill goes up, there is little doubt that other programs important to seniors and people with disabilities will be impacted in a negative way. So we just looked at the proposals included in the recently approved budget resolution. First, Medicare. Medicare is cut by nearly $500 billion. Seniors, and you know this from all the town meetings you, you have in your state, seniors cannot afford to pay more for less coverage. Half of all Medicare beneficiaries have incomes of less than $26,200 a year. They spend a quarter of their Social Security checks on out-of-pocket health care costs. Second, Medicaid and subsidies that make up the coverage for the Affordable Care Act and the, uh, would be cut by $1.3 trillion. Medicaid provides health care to low-income people. Middle-class Americans rely on Medicaid for long-term care after they've exhausted their savings. A lot of people think Medicaid is just for poor people. But what Medicaid is uh, predominantly helps people who were middle class lost their assets because you cannot afford to spend seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year for nursing home care and have too much left in a, in a few years. So these are middle class people who need Medicaid uh, to cover uh, nursing home care. Uh, two thirds, <clears throat> two thirds of all nursing home care is paid for financed by the Medicaid program, which also provides uh, home care and community-based services that allow seniors to stay in, in their homes. There just isn't a way to cut the Medicaid program <clears throat> by a trillion dollars and not limit seniors' access to long-term care services. Third, by repealing the Affordable Care Act, the budget and tax plan leaves millions of Americans uninsured and that would be especially harmful to um, the 40% of enrollees who are age 50 to 64 and who would then enter the Medicare program in worse health, uh, costing more money and less money uh, would be there uh, for, the Medicaid, for the Medicare program. Fourth, the budget plan uh, we see would cut income security programs, including supplemental security income, by $653 billion over 10 years. The SSI program provides vital and much needed economic security for eight and a half million low income seniors and people with disabilities, including children and severe uh, functional, that have severe functional limitations. Instead of cutting SSI, Congress should update and improve the program for vulnerable Americans who would depend on uh, social security uh, SSI for their basic needs. And I understand uh, uh, a bill will be introduced in the Senate soon to do that. Uh, Congressman uh, Grijalva has a bill that we support in the House that does the same. Finally, uh, the National Committee opposes the budget's call to cut non-defense discretionary programs by, by $800 billion over the next 10 years. This is in addition to the sequester spending caps. What does this mean? It means that by 2027, funding for non-defense programs would be 18% below 2017 levels and nearly 30% below 2010 levels, adjusting for inflation. These cuts will, would undermine programs and agencies that are so important and vital uh, to seniors, people with disabilities, programs like the Older Americans Act, Meals on Wheels, pretty popular, it would be severely impacted. Alzheimer's disease and cancer research at NIH, LIHEAP. Uh, some of the, you are in states where the LIHEAP Low Income Energy Assistance Program is very important. And of course, housing assistance uh, for low income elderly persons. So in, in some summary, the Republican budget and tax proposals would cause misery 
for millions of working and middle class Americans. Why, why is this being done? Why is this even being talked about? I think it's in order to deliver on a campaign promise and achieve a partisan goal. And Senator Stabenow, you commented on how important it is to put uh, people before politics. I've been saying that over and over again. This should be about people, not politics, not about meeting some campaign promise. And uh, we would hope that the Congress would oppose these, we call them Robin Hood in reverse, budget and tax proposals. And we hope that members of the Senate would pay attention to this uh, hearing and try to protect and expand the retirement and health security commitments that have been made to generations of Americans. Thank you so much. Uh, and. Uh, I know that everyone here uh, would agree, certainly, with your statements. And I, I do want to say we're so pleased to have Senator Maisie Hirono, who is here with us, and Senator Chris Van Hollen. Thank you so much from Maryland. And so now we're pleased to hear from Luz Aravalo. Uh, Ms. Aravalo, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for coming in from Boston. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to um, be here. And, to, and for the opportunity to speak on behalf of my clients. So in my clinic, we represent low and moderate income taxpayers, and I really mean that. They are taxpayers. These are folks who, even though they might, may not pay federal tax, they do pay sales, excise, and a number of other regressive taxes, such as Medicare and Social Security, and they do it with pleasure because they understand that there's a benefit. These taxpayers are often eligible for the two credits, two tax credits that are refundable. There are several more, but these two are critical for my clients. The Earned Income Tax Credit and the Child Tax Credit, the refundable portion of the Child Tax Credit. Earned Income Tax Credit, I think we all know, but it's, it's an additional amount of money given to taxpayers who earn income, and it's based on how much they earn, the number of children they have, et cetera. It's also given to single taxpayers without children, but uh, a little less money. This has been shown to not only improve the health of the children, the mothers, it has boosted um, education uh, gains in children, and it, of course, increases the contributions to Social Security and Medicare. These tax credits are successful in eliminating poverty. What will happen with some of the proposals I've heard, if there's a delay in processing these refunds, as, as I've heard, uh, it's not just an inconvenience. For many of my clients, this could be catastrophic. I've seen situations where my clients already, they, uh, some of their refunds are delayed. And what happens to them is that, I'll give you an example. I have this wonderful client who needed to do a DNA test for his child to be able to petition him in a, this immigration petition. Without this DNA test, he couldn't do that. The test cost $1,000. He was waiting for that refund to come, and uh, it was the only way for him to pay for this. This was a matter of life and death. I have a client more recently who came to me because he had not received his refund of $1,100. He needed to go to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico and visit his father home, still um, waiting for that refund. Because these credits work, any additional delay is just going to cause more hardship for my clients. Now, you asked what works and how I know that this works. I have a client who was able to use his, her three years of tax refunds to save for a down payment on her home. Now she's a homeowner. It has to be a multifamily home. It's the best thing that they can assure that there's additional income to pay the mortgage, but she's doing it as a single mom, and she's proud to have done this. I have another client who, after being exploited as a landscaper, not unusual for my immigrant clients. He learned a business, and he used his refund to pay for his trailer, his lawnmower, and now he is supporting his family as his own landscaper. And in addition, the other intangible but very meaningful benefit in our tax system is not just that, oh, this is terrific, I'm going to get a refund when I file my taxes. Well. In my own experience, I saw my own parents when they went to do their returns, and I could see that by doing that, you feel integrated into this American mainstream. There's no stigma attached to these credits, and that's what makes them a very effective anti-poverty tool. I have some recommendations 
because I do believe, I've seen it, that the EITC fosters the American dream, that without the EITC, many of my families will not be able to move out of poverty, and that's because our minimum wage is not a living wage. So I have made a few recommendations for this committee. One of them is to please strengthen, increase and strengthen the EITC for families and also for workers who don't have children. Under our current system, a low-wage single taxpayer is being taxed into poverty. If, you, if it be possible to increase the child care and dependent tax credit, right now this credit is too low, it's too modest, and it doesn't effectively offset the high cost of child care. The other flaw in the EITC system is that it's not available to survivors of domestic violence who cannot file as joint or as head of households. This is a problem that we actually solved in Massachusetts, but it needs to be resolved at the federal level. Thank you. And I urge you to oppose any measure that will increase any taxable income for low-wage families, for any families, of course. And that when discussing tax reform, the American values that we believe in, i.e. that nobody who works hard should be poor, should drive our policy. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, for your testimony and for your recommendations. As you were talking, I was thinking about the fact that the White House tax framework actually uh, increases the lowest rate uh, for taxes so that someone who's paying at the 10 percent rate would actually end up paying a higher rate while the top rate uh, is dramatically lower. reduced. So thank you very much for recommending things that actually reward work and help lift people out of poverty. Uh, so pleased to have uh, Jean Sperling back with us. Mr. Sperling, we, we welcome uh, you and appreciate your years of public service. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you. Uh, there are many ways that what's being proposed on this tax side are deeply flawed from an economic perspective, a fiscal perspective, and a values perspective. And I'd like to start by zeroing in on combining what Senator Wyden was mentioning on the 401k with what, what Max is talking about, because it is so important to understand how cynical this 401k proposal is. This is the mother of all tax gimmicks, but it's worse than that. Sometimes a tax gimmick is just uh, an artificial pay for, it's not, it's not responsible, but maybe it wouldn't do as much harm. But let's start with the following. We just went through seven or eight months where we were told by, by the Republican Party and this White House that there was no choice but to cut Medicaid by a trillion dollars. No choice, because there was such a long-term uh, entitlement issue. No choice but to cut 20 million people off. So with that in mind, let's understand how this 401k works. Now, when I was at the White House, we used to have kind of a, a name for a gimmick like this. We'd basically say, this is like telling uh, you, Senator Stabenow, that you can pay your 2019 taxes this year at a 30% discount. It's kind of good for you, and you'll raise, the deficit will go down this year. So the problem is when you come to 2019, you're not getting that revenue. The debt goes up. That is what this 401k proposal is. It is asking people who right now get, make contributions with pre-tax. And the idea is that it builds up, and then they do pay taxes on it later as they retire, maybe at a lower rate. We're expecting those taxes. So they're going to now tell people, no, you have to pay, put your money into 401k in an after-tax. Now think about what that does. It is a fake uh, pay for. It is a fake raise because you're just, just like the person who gets to pay their 2019 taxes at a discount this year, you're taking taxes that would be paid in 2030 or 2027 and you're moving them this year and you're pretending to be fiscally responsible uh, because you're adding revenue. But what are you doing? You are increasing the debt 
exactly in the outer years where at the same time they are suggesting we have no choice but to cut Medicaid, no choice but to cut Medicare, no choice but to cut Social Security. So you cannot <laughs> underestimate the cynicism of this move. It is not just an artificial pay for that makes their deficit. You'd think you could live within a one and a half trillion dollar deficit increase, but you have to do this gimmick. But this gimmick will then make the out years worse. And I don't need, and Max will tell you, I will tell you, they will then use that as an excuse to say there is no choice but to cut Medicare, Social Security. This is a gimmick that does harm and is designed to do harm and is designed to create a case for cutting taxes, I mean for cutting benefits, and we should oppose it and make sure people understand it on those terms. Um, just on the, uh, uh, the regressive or unfairness of this tax cut, I mean, it's just worth remembering one or two things. I mean, one, the estate tax, we, we share the view that Americans would like to save money, have a little nest egg, and leave it to their children. That's an American value. What Republicans have done over the years is pretend that we're somehow taxing people who have like a small nest egg. If you have under $11 million, if you were lucky enough to leave your children $10.9 million, you pay zero, not one penny. That means that every bit, every penny of the hundreds of billions they will give will only go to the two out of 1,000 families that have something over 11 million. I mean, it's pretty amazing to design a tax cut that only goes to people who have over 11 million to leave, but that's what that does. And on the pass-through, understand the following. Most small businesses probably make business owners make under 230,000. Their rate, whether it's 25 or 28 percent, that's what it is. So when you're designing this pass-through rate, by definition, it is only going to the people who would be at a higher rate. The Tax Policy Center estimates that 86 to 88 percent of the tax relief in a pass-through uh, would go to the top one percent. And it won't be the guy who owns the hardware store. It will be uh, film producers. It will be, uh, uh, you know, real estate developers. Have we seen any of them uh, recently? And it will be hard to explain to the teacher or to the people they cut out in the pass-through, even the doctor, the upper middle class people, why it is that you are designing a tax cut by definition that can only go or overwhelmingly go to the top one uh, percent. Um, and just my last point is just let's just remember what the, their overall thesis is. Their overall thesis for their going to 20 percent, their over two trillion dollars of net tax cuts they would give to companies, is that the number one problem that working families must have is that major multinational corporations don't have a big enough of a tax cut, which is really interesting because over the last decade, they have had the highest decade of profitability. And at the same time, you've had the lot lowest level of compensation to employees. So over the last decade, profitability goes up, employee compensation goes down. And yet, the entire thesis of their case is that if you had $2 trillion, you wouldn't spend it on college opportunity, infrastructure, training, or skills, or an expansion of the earned income tax credit. You would give the largest companies in our country a $2 trillion tax cut. That is their thesis for the case. And we should accept their thesis and put it to the American people, because I don't think most people think the biggest problem in their lives is that the major nat national, multinational companies don't have a $2 trillion tax cut. Thank you so much for uh, clearly stating the case. Thank you very, very much. And uh, again, last but certainly not least, uh, we're so glad to have Mr. Bruce Bartlett here. Thank you for your thoughtfulness and for your public service over the years to our country. Thank you very much. Um, with, with your indulgence, I'd like to talk a little bit about political strategy here. Sure. I'd be happy to discuss taxes all you want in the Q&A, and I associate myself entirely with Gene's remarks. Uh, 
I know more about your situation than you may think I do. Uh, when I went to work for Jack Kemp in January of 1977, the Republicans had just lost the White House. They had, I think they had 34 seats in the Senate and uh, about 140 or so in, in the House. They were down and out. And my boss, uh, Jack Kemp, as some of you probably know, is, was a former football player, professional football player. And he felt that the problem of the party is that it was too much on defense and not enough on offense. He thought Republicans were spending way too much time just criticizing, attacking, and trying to stop Democratic programs, and that they had nothing positive to offer. And, and he, uh, he felt, and uh, contrary to what you may believe, uh, the tax cut idea that he and I and others came up with in, in 1977 was not at all popular among the Republican rank and file, because back in those days, uh, contrary to today, they actually believed you should balance the budget. And they were willing, uh, historically speaking, to support tax increases and, and oppose tax cuts for that reason. You can check the record. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower uh, vetoed every tax cut uh, that his party tried to enact during the 1950s. Uh, a considerable number of Republicans voted against the Kennedy-Johnson tax cut. Richard Nixon extended the Vietnam War surtax in 1969 and, and, and signed into law the Revenue Raising Tax Reform Act of 1969. Uh, and uh, Gerald Ford, uh, uh, like Eisenhower, vetoed a permanent tax cut, a tax rate reduction, and would support only a one-shot uh, tax rebate in 1974. So, uh, and, he was, and he did so because he was concerned about the loss of revenue. Now, what, uh, what we did in, 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 uh, when I was with Kemp is every time a Democrat came up with uh, uh, some program that involves spending, we would say, we need to cut taxes instead. And this is how they created the dynamic of tax cuts versus spending increases. And my old friend Jude Winiski, wh whom I worked for, uh, came up, called this the two Santa Claus theory, which some of you may have heard of. He said the Democrats are the spending Santa Claus, Republicans should be the tax cut Santa Claus, and the American people just figure out what they think is what they, what they want. And, uh, and now this was not actually a completely ridiculous theory, but it assumed something that Jude was not, uh, didn't think about, which is a hard balanced budget requirement. And, and that did not exist. And once that went out the window, which unfortunately I had something to do with, uh, the, the floodgates were opened. Now, to care a, a follow on with something that Gene talked about, uh, the, the, the Republican uh, leadership, uh, I mean the intellectual leadership, I'm talking about people like Alan Greenspan and uh, uh, Herb Stein, uh, they were upset with this tax cut program. They were very concerned that it, it would lead to an increase in the deficit, which would make inflation worse, which was our number one problem. And they rationalized supporting uh, the Kemper-Roth tax cut, uh, which I helped draft and which Reagan endorsed and was passed into law in 1981. They rationalized this by saying, well, if we create a deficit big enough, then even the Democrats will have to support a cut in spending. And they called this starve the beast theory. And, and Gene is exactly correct. And one of the things that I wish uh, Congress would do, or, or, or just you, uh, you guys, is when the distribution tables are put out for the, the, the impact of this uh, Republican tax plan, you need to include in it the, the, the massive spending cuts that are virtually inevitable. The minute, the minute that ink is dry on Trump's signature of this tax bill, should it pass, they will start talking about Oh, the deficit, the deficit, and all these good government groups, you know, like the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget that you never hear from uh, these days, they will suddenly be paraded around as the most responsible people saying, oh, we're so sorry we have to slash spending for all these programs that we promised to protect, but the deficit is so terrible. And, and, and again, the, the Kansas experience, I don't think it's anywhere near enough publicity. Uh, this is exactly what happened there. The state of, uh, of Kansas hired Arthur Laffer, my old friend, and paid him $75,000 to lie. He just lied. He didn't produce a study. He didn't do any kind of analysis. He just said, based on my authority as the originator of the Laffer curve, which is in the Smithsonian Institution, 
I am saying revenues will not go down, and, therefore, and, and that was the basis on which this tax cut was enacted. And when it became obvious that revenues were hemorrhaging and there was a huge deficit, did they say, oh, we made a mistake, sorry, you know, uh, like Steve Martin, you know, in, in, on Saturday Night Live. No, they said we have to slash spending for the poor. That's all they ever want to do. They hate the poor. They, God, honest to God, they do. Or at least they have no respect for them. They think the only reason they'll ever get a job and do a lick of work is if they have a gun to their head. And, and I think every Republican believes that in their heart of hearts. Uh, so I, I, I've run out of time, but I'm more than happy to amplify on, on any of these points I made. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And I, I want to uh, acknowledge Senator Nelson, who has joined us. Thank you from Florida. Senator Klobuchar from Minnesota is with us as well. So we have the whole country uh, uh, from coast to coast uh, represented. Um, uh, and thank you again to all of you. So I'm going to start with a few questions and then turn to Senator Wyden and then other uh, colleagues as well. But um, Mr. Bartlett, uh, I mean, basically... What, what you're saying is that the, the uh, tax scheme that the Republicans have really is two parts. It's a double whammy for people. Uh, the big tax giveaways go to those at the very, very top. So middle class or low income uh, folks won't see any more money in their pocket. But then secondly, uh, they will actually see their costs go up when the Republicans come back and say, oh my gosh, now we have to cut uh, services, uh, education, uh, we have schools, we can't build roads, we, we can't do anything that the majority of Americans need. Is that really what you're saying? Well, that's correct. And of course, they're, they're not even waiting of uh, for the, the tax cut. Uh, there's huge, huge spending cuts in the, in the budget, as you know, uh, which are contrary to what they said. Now, uh, just to, to amplify some, uh, my, my statement, what I think Democrats really ought to be doing is talking about infrastructure. This is something that actually helps people, and it's quite obvious from every economic study that's ever been done that this creates jobs. Right. I think the economy is suffering from a lack of aggregate demand. If we're willing to, spend, to, to increase the national debt by $1.5 trillion, every penny of that money should go into infrastructure. And, 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 of course, I don't need to tell people that we're seeing terrible f problems from global warming. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist uh, to, to see that if temperatures are higher, we're going to have more evaporation, we're going to have more moisture in the atmosphere, we're going to have more rain, more, more flooding, and we should be desperate. We should be building huge uh, seawalls around the, 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 the whole uh, uh, lower part of the United States and, and this would create jobs. See, I think sometimes we ask too much of the tax system. Uh, I understand there's a temptation to kind of play the Republican game. They say, oh, let's cut taxes for the rich. Democrats say, no, let's cut taxes for the middle class. I don't think that's a game y you win. I think what you do is you turn over the table and say, taxes are not the issue here. People are not overtaxed. The middle class, the median family, if you look on the Tax Policy Center website, are paying half of, uh, 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 of, of the a an average tax or income tax rate, half of what they paid in 1980, and they're playing a much lower marginal tax rate as well. So with all due respect, the middle class doesn't need a tax cut either. What they need is higher wages, and they'll get higher wages if there's demand for labor, and if the, go the federal government can create that demand by s having the an infrastructure program. John Maynard Keynes was right. Everything he said in the 1930s was exactly correct, and it's been true for the last eight years. I'm sure Gene will agree with me. Uh, the, the, I think one of our biggest problems was we didn't do enough in 2009, uh, but that's another story. Mr. Brother, you are singing my song. I have been saying for some time that uh, if Republicans are willing uh, to focus on $1.5 trillion dollars uh, in uh, deficit spending, let's put it into a major effort to rebuild America. Water, 
uh, sewer, roads, bridges, internet. Uh, we, uh, many of us uh, care deeply, all of us do, about uh, high-speed internet, broadband in rural communities that would really create jobs. And we know that if you took that one and a half trillion dollars and put it into rebuilding America, we could create over 22 million jobs. So I couldn't agree more. One other quick thing, uh, Mr. Bell, I want to ask you, uh, and that is, I just want to be clear um, uh, that when we've looked at nationally trickle-down uh, tax cuts or Kansas, when the Republicans say that these tax giveaways will be paid for by economic growth, do you agree with that? Uh, uh, Senator, that's a lie. Yeah. It's always been a lie. Uh, I mean, I can prove it very easily. Back when I was working for Jack Kemp and we were promoting uh, the, the Kemp Roth tax bill, our belief was that you might get back a third uh, of, of the revenue. That is, we were arguing not that it would pay for itself, but that it would pay for some of it, you see. The, the argument Democrats made in those days was you, you cut taxes a dollar, you lose a dollar. And we said, no, you might only lose 70 cents. That was our argument. And we agreed completely with studies that the CBO did, which I just happened to have, understanding fiscal policy, 1978, and an economic analysis of the Kemper-Roth bill. These were studies that we agreed with, and they basically said, look, the CBI did a very serious study of the impact of the Kennedy tax cut, which we modeled our tax cut on. They said there was enough additional growth that maybe we got back a third of the static revenue loss. And we agreed with that. That was our position. That always, was always our position. And he, it was even Arthur Laffer's position. And now they just lie and just say it'll pay for itself. And there's not one iota of evidence that will support this argument. They just assert it. They put out no studies. They put out no analysis. They have no numbers for anything. And, and, and I think it's just uh, uh, horrible that the uh, intellectual decline of my former party is just, is just uh, I lack the word. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask one more question and then turn to Senator Wyden. I have many questions for all of you, uh, but uh, it, uh, I do want to ask uh, Ms. LaFrenz Falk, um, you talked about some of the sacrifices. Yeah, you're, you're a mom, <coughs> um, and we've heard about four-day school weeks, and you've talked about other ways in which public health has been jeopardized and so on. I wonder if you might speak any more from the standpoint of children, what you have seen, and what do you think the long-term impacts of some of these kinds of sacrifices that uh, families and their children are being asked to make will have on Kansas families? Well, thank you very much for that question. Um, you know, what we're seeing, I mean, I know right off the bat that every Wednesday in Topeka, our school district has a hiring fair. They're trying to hire teachers because we're, we're missing them. Um, so you, when you don't have enough teachers, you have larger class sizes, the kids don't, you know, they just don't have the opportunities to learn in an environment that's as conducive for that. Um, I had talked to a friend of mine who also works with the Kansas National Education Association in Topeka, and she had talked to me about some of the numbers for, you know, in 2008 to 2009, we had, you know, 13,000 kids in Kansas or thereabouts. And now we have closer to 15,000 kids, but, you know, or we have 500 less teachers, you know, and staff members. So the kids are, are really suffering with that. What um, about, let me just interrupt. Sure. You had mentioned the lost children, and Mr. Ward, right. uh, 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 Representative Ward mentioned that as well. Who are the lost children? That literally children were lost in the system? Yes, Senator. Yes, Senator. What happens is they would be determined to be children in need of care because they were abused, neglected. They were placed in um, foster homes or in group homes. And because the agency didn't have the oversight, we have two private companies that run our social services budget like this. We didn't have enough social workers to do the oversight, and these kids fell through the cracks. And when we had a report to our committee, 74 were gone. So, but what has happened to those 74 children? They're, some of them have been found with the publicity 
and some of the research, but there are still too many of them missing. Unbelievable. Senator Wyden. Thank you, Senator Stabenow. And uh, Senator Stabenow covered so many topics so well. The question is just how do you pick up at this point? And um, Mr. Bartlett, thank you for your comments with respect to growth. I mean, we're looking at these numbers, and uh, the administration and their friends in the Republican Party are just bringing out these growth fairies and unicorn mathematicians and the like. And so you've said it very well. And I also want to thank uh, our friend, uh, you know, Max. What's striking is the healthcare debate for so long was essentially about a path to get tax breaks for those at the very top. And now we're talking about tax breaks for those at the very top to be financed by sticking it to Medicare and health care needs. So your points are well taken. And also, by the way, when you do those things, you get out from under a lot of the funding mechanisms for these programs. I think what I want to do, though, is focus primarily on the comparisons between Kansas and what's going on in Washington, D.C. And I think it would be very helpful, uh, Mr. Ward, if you could take us through this, I mean, absolute forehead slapping routine of how a basketball coach in your state figured out how to be declared something akin to a pastor and pay no taxes and kind of tell us whether people actually knew as this debate was going forward how outlandish some of this was because I think we're seeing that here again today and I think it's something that uh, Gene and Mr. Bartlett would identify with, you know, tremendous ballyhoo today. We're going to keep the top rate, 39.6, for lots of people who make lots of money. But the reality is when you follow what they're really saying, they're going to try to make almost everybody a pass-through. And so the people who are paying 39.6, after all this ballyhoo today about keeping the top rate, they're really going to pay 25. They're going to get a massive uh, tax cut. So... Start us with that, uh, if you would, Mr. Ward, essentially how this pass-through scam uh, evolved in the state of Kansas and what lessons there are for us as we try to prevent America from being having such nonsense inflicted on us uh, in the copycat routine. Well, it wasn't presented that way, Senator. What it was presented... I'm so surprised. Yeah, shocking. <laughs> It was presented as a jobs program. It was presented as economic development. In, in fact, the governor of our state said it was a shot of adrenaline into the heart of the Kansas economy. Hmm. And he promised us 25,000 new jobs in a four-year period of time. Over and over, the segment of our population in our House and our Senate that wanted these tax cuts came up and argued it was a jobs program. Um, and there was, and they used the Art Laffer envelope um, formula to justify that. I have to um, disagree with my colleague at the end of the table just a little bit. In Kansas, and we have a lot of them, Republicans don't all hate essential government services. There were many of them who stood up and said, this is wrong. It will be devastating to our state. And we could not have reversed significant amounts of the policy without their help. Um, there are still a lot of reasonable, fiscally responsible Republicans, um, and they are appalled by it. I was a very vocal critic, and over and over out in public, people would come up to me and say, you keep going, and I'm a Republican. <laughs> did, the press, did the press cover this kind of thing? Because, like today, when the Republicans ballyhooed this, we're keeping uh, the top rate for people at the top, not a soul made the point that the economists I'm talking to have been making, which is, hey, people are going to um, make themselves passers. By the way, they can still keep the capital gains break and the like. So was that reported in Kansas when this was going on? It's a complicated subject, but it, they caught on pretty quick. I want to defend our coach. He's a fabulous basketball coach. And sure. while I understand it makes uh, a good poster, but that what he was – one of many, many, many Kansans. If you tell Kansans there's a way not to pay taxes, they're going to do it. They may not think it's good policy. They may argue you should change the policy. But as long as you say you cannot pay taxes, they're going to do it. And that's the fundamental flaw with the theory that somehow 
The second piece that's really important that happened in Kansas with the selling of these jobs was if you put this money in these wealthy people's hands, they're going to do the right thing. They're going to grow their businesses in Kansas and expand. We're going to attract businesses from other states. Entrepreneurs are going to start up in Kansas, and it's going to be this explosion. Well, the results were much different. We had stagnant job growth. 1,000 growth one year. We lost 9,000 jobs in 2016. It was very, our economic development or our yeah, expansion of our economy was very sluggish. And the media did catch on. And they were very good after that policy became known and what you're talking about happened. Um, and that's why we were able to win so many seats in the last election, both moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats who had a more fiscally responsible view of the state. I, I understand your, your, your point. I just hope that we can get the message out earlier before so much damage you know, is done, because I listened carefully to your part about people shooting each other and the kind of, kind of desperation that uh, despair um, generates. One last question for our friend Mr. Uh, Sperling. So back into the business of you know, phony numbers and the like, we heard Mr. Ward talk about about how the businesses were going to somehow generate magically so much, you know, revenue. Doesn't that sound akin to the uh, claim made by the CEA head, Mr. Hassett, who said that the corporate uh, tax cut is going to lead to $4,000 yearly wage increases for the average worker? Is there any kind of halfway independent support for that proposition? No, it's 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 ludicrous, and and uh, you know I, I'm disappointed to see people on the other side who uh, I consider friends and uh, who I've debated with and sparred with over the years, you know, going outside the bounds of what is normally you know discussion. You know, as Bruce said, you talk about whether dynamic scoring will affect a little bit here, a little more there. Um, the idea to have that you'd have people who making arguments that are are just ludicrous on their face that somehow it's going to you know create so much growth but I also just believe though that we should be just looking at the overall premise of this now look I, I'm I'm a pragmatist when we came in with President Clinton in 93 there really looked like a serious diagnosis that major major companies, people were not investing because they really thought long-term interest rates and the deficit were going to go up forever. And so not out of any ideology, not out of any being a deficit hawk, but figuring out a way to progressively change those expectations, lowered, invest, lowered long-term investment rates, and led to quite an investment boon. By the way, when people are talking about their magical growth numbers, you can remind them that we have had 4% growth before, and it was during the Clinton administration. It wasn't 3 it was 4%. If you did the private sector growth, it was well over uh, 4%, and it was after a responsible plan that raised taxes and increased the EITC, just, just for the record. Um, but, the, um, but, but when you look now... When you look now, Senator, what you see is that we have a major problem, which is that when companies are getting more profitable, it's not that they're lacking profitability. If that was like, if you really had this record out there that when companies made a little more money, man, the first thing they did was invest in new jobs in the U.S. and give their employees a, way, a raise, then hey, and they just didn't have enough, you know, profits from lower taxes, then we could have a discussion. But why are, we even, why are we even having this discussion? I want to repeat, there has been record profitability over the last decade. CEO, CEO pay has done very well. Executive pay has done well. Bonuses have done well. But the part that goes to employees is at a record low. So it's not that we have this major problem. You have a lot of our major companies have huge amounts of cash that they are just having sit on the sidelines. They talk about they need to repatriate, but they have major cash, tens of billions that they're not investing. So it is a pure ideological or political diagnosis to look and say, this is the problem. 
the, you know, if, mm. if, we, you're, if we were doing a serious diagnosis, we would be talking about increasing their income tax credit to get people to work, uh, infrastructure jobs, a major, major focus on uh, connecting people with the skills they need to encourage more people to locate here. All of those you could make a good bipartisan case. There is just, it is, it just, you know, the reason I can't get into even like going through the numbers is that the whole idea that there is a deep connection between rising corporate profitability of the major corporations and giving raises to their typical workers is so proven to be uh, uh, bankrupt uh, over the last decade that it's amazing to me that this is their new theory. This is kind of the new trickle down. They are more focused on giving major companies a $2 trillion tax cut, and that is going to be your magic silver bullet. And again, I think we should... We should, be, we should be willing to say that's their thesis. We're willing to take it head on. I, I, I really wonder who out there, which Trump voters sat around and thought, you know, the major, major multinational companies, the one paying their executive millions and millions of dollars, you know, the biggest problem in my life is that they just need a really huge corporate tax cut. Senator, Senator Can you, could, I, could I add something to that? Sure. Uh, the, the the argument that uh, uh, tax reform is going to raise wages is simply a lie. Kevin Hassett is a liar. Uh, he knows this is all bullshit. And, and here's some very good information uh, to prove that point. In the last page of my statement, I looked up what happened to real, let's see, full-time, median, usual, weekly wage earnings, wage and salary workers, 16 and over, at what happened after the 1986 tax reform. You can see wages fell for 10 years. They didn't start to rise until after Bill Clinton raised taxes. So the, the, the real-world experience is exactly the opposite. And you have to understand that all this mumbo-jumbo that Kevin put out is just, it's all, well, let's, let's, let's assume everything is equal, you know, and let's take a lot of extreme assumptions that do not hold at all in the real world, and then we'll say, in the long run, without ever defining the long run. This is just all economists speak for lying, and we all know the old saying, you know, liars figure, but figures, or, no, I got it back. <laughs> anyway, you know what I'm talking about. And, I, and just one other thing, if you go to the Federal Reserve's Z1 uh, release, you'll find that Major uh, the U.S. corporations are now sitting on $2.3 trillion of financial assets that they could spend to invest tomorrow. And the fact that interest rates are so low is further proof that, there is not, that we have more saving uh, than we actually need. And, and, and so, uh, again, uh, their arguments are just complete my, my, nonsense. My colleagues are waiting. I just want to make uh, one... 10-second response to Gene's point about how responsible people ought to know better. What was really unfortunate about this debate with respect to corporate tax cuts leading to $4,000 of mag magical wages is when you had the independent budgeters, you know, the Congressional Budget Office, Joint Committee on Taxation saying, nope, most of that uh, relief is going to go to 75, 80 percent of shareholders, you know, people who own capital. They actually took down the paper at the Treasury Department that made the point you and Bruce are talking about. It's fine to have disagreements. It's another thing to do stuff like that. You all have been great. Senator Stabenow, great hearing. I'm Thank off you. to have Thank a you, bunch Senator. of meetings on this very topic. But uh, Senator Thank Stabenow you. and my colleagues are going to do this topic just Can I just make one quick point because it's related to yours, which is just the following. I'll be fast. Yes, on this terrible tax cut bill, you could say it's slightly better that they're going to at least keep the 39.6% rate that Bill Clinton and Barack Obama worked on for at least some people. We'll see if that happens. But remember, when you have that differential between that and the pass-through rate, that will be the greatest incentive to tax evasion that we've ever had. So when you have up at 40% and a lower rate at 25%, that differential is not one we've seen before. And you are right, it will be a full employment for the IRS, for uh, uh, accountants, and it will, I think it will lead lots of people who would normally not think about tax planning to try to uh, uh, 
do things that are untoward, and I think it's going to be quite a mess that they are they are creating for quite oh, some time. Great. Well, thank you so much. And for those that are joining us on Facebook, uh, that may not have been at the beginning when we were introducing everyone. Uh, I just want to indicate that uh, we have been hearing uh, great passion from Bruce Bartlett, who was the domestic policy advisor to President Reagan and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy under President George H.W. Bush, along with our other witnesses. I say that only to say these are bipartisan voices. Uh, we, we want uh, objective information, and we appreciate uh, all of you being here. And now, someone who's been waiting patiently, Senator Chris Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Senator Stabenow. Thank you for bringing us uh, together, and thank all of you for being here. And let me uh, start by thanking the witnesses from Kansas uh, for uh, blowing the whistle on what a fraud trickle-down economics was in Kansas. Uh, we saw from the Bush tax cuts in the early 2000s that it was a total bust for the country. The most recent experiment in Kansas was a bust as well with devastating consequences, which you've uh, talked about. Uh, to Max, I, I want to thank you for being such a strong voice for a long time and preserving and protecting basic economic security and dignity uh, for retirees and making sure that people in their older age have Medicare. Uh, I sat next to Paul Ryan for years on the House Budget Committee where I was the senior Democrat, where year after year he would talk about the dangers of the rising debt. And the reality is, in my view, we've got to address the debt. But here we are now. Mm. And the same person who lectured people about increasing the debt and the dangers is about to finance a huge tax cut for wealthy people, in part by increasing the national debt by $1.5 trillion, and financing the other part, at the end of the day, by coming back and cutting Medicare and Medicaid and education. Uh, we know that because it was in their budget. So it turns out that their talk about the debt was simply a good excuse for cutting Medicare, Social Security, and education, uh. and nothing to do about the debt, because now they're perfectly happy to put a big part of a big tax cut for wealthy people on the national credit card. So thank you for uh, being there all along. Uh, to Ms. Aravello, thank you for talking about the EITC and the uh, Child Independent Tax Credit. We need to strengthen Maybe. and expand both of them, because as you said, if you're a hardworking person in this country, you should not be below the federal poverty line. You should be able to live in dignity, and uh, we need to work on that. Gene Sperling has done a lot of work on that. Many of us have proposals, and, a, and a, we, we'd love to work with you in terms of improving that uh, going forward. Bruce Bartlett, thank you for being a voice of sanity and clarity <laughs> and straight talk uh, about what happened, and we're going to need your advice and counsel uh, over the next couple of weeks because this is an urgent matter for the mm -hmm. country. I mean, you pass this thing it is going to do incredible damage to our country for years and years uh, to come. And the reason they're moving this so quickly is they know damn well that when the American public figures out what's in this, they will be against it. So they're trying to move it really quickly. Uh, to Gene Sperling, let me just say thank you for your clarity on this. And I, I want to ask you a question because we've talked a lot about the $2 trillion tax cut for big corporations, right? And we've talked about how the fact that, that the claim that, you know, that tax cut will flow through to increasing workers' wages is, is a fraud. Um, but it, it's even worse than a giveaway of $2 trillion to big corporations that don't need it. We could well see, and you've written about this, and this is what I want you to talk a little bit about, how this could actually incentivize American corporations to move their jobs overseas even more than the current tax code does. So in addition to the fact that the most pressing part and urgent issue in the country is not giving a, <laughs> corporations a big tax break, it can actually end up really screwing workers throughout the country who will see job loss because of these perverse incentives. Can you talk about that? Yeah, happy to, and I, and I know we talked. Happy to, and I know we talked. I know Senator Klobuchar and I talked. And I used Minnesota as an example. Uh, so I have a, um, I'm not, there's, I'm not like selling books like Bruce. <laughs> Though here's Bruce's book. It's a good book. 
but if you want to, but I, yes, I just had a piece up on the Atlantic online now that walks through this. And essentially, um, they have, um, uh, I mean, you know, it's like my basketball game. Um, I'm not fast, I'm not quick, but I can't jump either. Um, this <laughs> remarkably is designed to actually encourage both continuing the shift of profits to tax havens in a global race to the bottom and actually encourages you to ship jobs overseas. Now, how does it work? Right. What they do is they say, we're going to have some type of global minimum tax. So at first you thought, well, that's okay. That's kind of what President Obama proposed. But his proposal said, if you go to any country, you're going to pay 19% that year no matter what you do. So you want to go to Bermuda and pay zero? Fine, but then you're going to pay 19% back to the United States. Now think about what that does. That means for all the tax havens in the world who want to attract the United States, really not much luck because you're going to pay 19% each and every year. When, when I was in the White House, you know, Jason Furman and I would get these you know, uh, um, you know, calls from people, people in the highest positions of some of our major technology and pharmaceutical companies. And you'd think, great, let's hear what, what they have. You know, let's hear about these great companies. All they want to talk about is this. I mean, think about the talent and the energy that goes into not innovation, not creating new jobs, no, how to figure out how to do international tax arbitrage mm -hmm. so you can get your profits up by paying less of your share to the American people. But if you had, a 19, if you had to pay 19% or some minimum tax in each country, it, it, you, it wouldn't make sense to keep doing this because no matter where it landed, you were going to pay them out. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the Trump and the GOP say, no, no, it's actually the average that you pay everywhere. So the example I gave is if you want to keep having – uh, paying zero in a tax haven or near zero in the Cayman Islands or Bermuda or Netherlands or you name it, uh, and you say, yeah, but, but GOP has a minimum tax, it's not for that country, it's just your average. So if you're a big U.S. company, the best idea would be to move, if you wanted to minimize your tax, is move operations in the United States to London or Germany or France, because whatever you paid there would then average the zero you paid. So if you paid a bill, so if you moved a billion dollars you were making in the United States and then you move it to overseas to countries where you pay a billion there, now you can get a billion of zero taxes somewhere else and it still will average out. And so you might say, well, gee, you know, you found some technical flaw. That's not what happened. We know what happened. The the more serious people the, who worked in the staff jobs of the Senate Finance and House Ways and Means Committee who said you have to have some type of minimum tax, they came in and said, we can't live with that. And so these companies designed a toothless minimum tax. If you're going to have one, design one that we can get around. Because the truth is, if you had a minimum tax with some teeth, there'd be a lot of complaining coming tomorrow. But there won't be much complaining because this was written and designed by the lobbyists for major multinational companies. Many of them I like dearly. But it's like you said of Kansas. If you give people the opportunity to evade taxes, they will. When you have a fair system, people will live by it. Right now, our major companies think that a path to profitability <coughs> is international tax shifting. Hmm. And now they saw that something that might be an end to it. They had designed a toothless proposal, and the Republicans took it. It wasn't by accident. It wasn't a technical flaw. This was the design of the major lobbyists for the major multinational companies who do the most aggressive in international tax arbitrage and planning. And it Senator, will provide even greater sweeteners for companies that move jobs and businesses overseas. It's exactly. And, you know, this wasn't just me. You know, this is, uh, uh, you know, Kim Clausen, who many rely, Professor Marie, said, you know, said the same thing. It's a double whammy. It both, it, it, it both encourages you to move. I think her example was you move to Germany and you make that money and then you move more money to Bermuda to offset it. Worst of, close to the worst of all worlds. Right. Senator, if I could just add something. I know there's a strong temptation to talk about jobs, 
But what's really being shipped abroad is intellectual property. Uh, that's how they manipulate the system. Let me give you an anecdote. Some years ago, I needed a new copy of Microsoft Word for a new computer. So I go to Microsoft.com, the, the standard Microsoft website. I downloaded the, or I, I, I put in my credit card, I downloaded the uh, software, but then my credit card company uh, refused the purchase. And I checked with them and I asked why. And they said, because the money is going to Luxembourg. And this looks very suspicious to us. Hmm. So what had happened is not one single person in Luxembourg, I'm willing to say, had anything whatsoever to do with writing the, the software for Microsoft Word. Hmm. What happened is Microsoft Washington State sold the intellectual property, sold the software to Microsoft Luxembourg mm -hmm. so that all the profits that accrue from this uh, software go to a tax shelter. And Luxembourg is a, is a huge tax uh, uh, shelter company or country uh, that, that doesn't get as much publicity as, as it should. And this is how they manipulate. They sell trademarks. They sell copyrights. They sell software. Nothing real is happening except it's just paper shuffling. So it's not so much jobs that are moving as tax base. They're simply shifting profits, uh, and nothing real is being created except uh, tax cuts for the ultra-wealthy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and Senator Hirono and then Senator Nelson. So, Senator Hirono. Thank you very much, and I thank all of you for um, uh, being on the panel. The whole idea, I think this is what you said, Gene, the whole idea of rising corporate profitability uh, resulting in higher wages for workers is what we would call in Hawaii Shibai and total bullshit. <laughs> so the American people get this. I hope so. They get this. So I would say that in a, an environment where facts do not matter, you know, we can sit here all day long talking about how terrible this plan is and they're going to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and all that. Those are facts. Facts are not impinging. But one thing that people do get is the wealthier the corporations get, they keep it, and it doesn't mean higher wages. So I think that we should keep repeating that, regardless of what kind of iterations of this tax plan the Republicans come up with. So I agree with you, Gene, that we don't, I don't even know why we're talking about this tax thing in a uh, semi-serious way, because they're just going to lie about it. Mm. So uh, to the extent that in Kansas this whole thing was sold as a jobs plan, I think we should be talking about creating jobs. I agree with you all that we should be talking about infrastructure because we know that every million or whatever in infrastructure creates ten, whatever creates multiple jobs. So I think we should repeat the, 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 what people feel is a truism about the corporate profitability not resulting in higher wages. I think people kind of get that without a lot of factual kind of stuff to muddy the waters. But I do have one question for Mr. Ward. Um, you know, the, the Coke Industries is headquartered in Wichita. And the Coke brothers are well known for the anti-tax, anti-government views. So I'm curious, when, tax, when Kansas cut all those taxes, did Coke Industries expand? Did they create any new jobs? Did they invest in their headquarters or do anything in Kansas? Um, Coke Industries has expanded in Wichita. Okay. Coke Industries has expanded in Wichita. They've created a huge complex in North Wichita. But when you look at small businesses uh -huh. and medium-sized businesses and large businesses, they didn't. There was no evidence. If you compared our job growth to the national job growth, we lost. There were more jobs created nationally. If you compared it to the four states that surround Kansas, Oklahoma, Colorado, Nebraska, and Missouri, we finished fifth Okay, mm -hmm. in job growth. It had none of the economic impact that was promised, period. <laughs> um, and, and no one knows, one last point, Senator, um, how many new pass-through entities were created because in Kansas that's confidential. But there is a strong suspicion that a lot of Coke Industries got switched over to pass-through. I don't have any evidence of that, but that was thought to be we, – we can't look at records like that. Well, I'm pretty sure that they took advantage of everything that they could as a result of what, what happened in Kansas. So, again, that's a factual kind of a, a – basis on which to argue against what the Republicans are attempting to do, but, you know, facts uh, do not impinge on these people. Mm. 
So um, I would, I, I personally would like to shift the discussion to why don't we really talk about creating jobs and let's uh, just, let's just um, deal with the, the BS that's being pushed out regarding uh, uh, a problem that's not even a problem. Really, that's what I'd like us to do. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Let's create jobs. Best way to move the economy forward. So and and uh, support pe more money in the pockets of uh, hardworking folks every day. Uh, Senator Nelson, welcome. Good afternoon and thank you. Um, I want you to know, uh, Mr. Bartlett, that I had the privilege of serving with Jack Kemp, mm. and. Uh, I wish we had a number of Jack Kemp's in the Congress today uh, because uh, he wouldn't put up with some of the nonsense that goes on. Uh, it was either you or Gene that was talking about uh, that the tax cut, maybe it was Kansas that you were talking about, whoever it was, uh, what could we reasonably expect you threw out the term a third that through growth of the deficit that is creating because of lower taxes, could you expect a, a third? Uh, is that a reasonable figure instead of 100 percent? Not necessarily. Right. I'm sorry. Uh, because uh, the, the, the third uh, uh, comes from studies of the Kennedy tax cut in the 1960s and the Reagan tax cut in 1980, 1980s, which were far better designed for the problems of the times. That is, they, we had a genuine problem, I would argue, uh, of taxes being too high. I remember, we had bracket creep. People were being pushed up into higher tax brackets. I think the, 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 the top tax rate of 70% of in 1980 was too high. So it was not unreasonable to think you would get more bang for the buck. But this tax cut is timed at a, uh, 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 when we don't have high taxes, we don't have rising taxes, uh, we have a top tax rate of only f of less than 40%, the, 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 the circumstances are completely different. I would say, I re just repeat, I think my analysis of the underlying macroeconomic problem is that we have inadequate aggregate demand, and economic theory and experience shows that the best way to deal with that is with government, direct government spending on goods and services. And I know that this is, you know, Gene's pal, uh, uh, Bill Clinton said, the end of uh, the year of big government is over, but I think the year of big government is back. And, and we need somebody to advocate for that and explain why. And Senator, I. I I think the case that this is going to be pro-growth is very weak, not, not just even directionally. Um, and listen, I, I'm not saying you couldn't figure out how to design things. Uh, um, you don't want to work with companies. If you had plans and strategies that were designed to help workers, companies hire more people, uh, start grow businesses here, do more training, uh, for people who were long-term unemployed or helping people when they're leaving the job to go other places or working and connecting credentialing, there, there are ways that you could work with the business community that could be pro-growth and could be win-win for all of us. But the suggestion right now, um, uh, and I know Senator Warren's here and it's a point she often makes powerfully, and this is what I was trying to make before, is that there's just no connection right now from the profits and the amount of cash that the people have with either increased investment or helping workers. And so then you have to ask, what is that money doing? And if it's just going to stock buybacks and higher uh, corporate salaries, it's deeply unfair, but you're also not getting the demand. You're giving it to people who have the least propensity to spend who are going to save. So you're going to help more people put more money in their bank account, but not necessarily in the economy. So I think you've got to look at the whole plan. Now, some people would say that also if you're going to increase by one and a half, the deficit by one half trillion or two trillion, you know, when they allow CBO and other people to do their work, they average a little bit of incentive with, is that going to make interest rates higher? Or what seems more likely to me is that 
as we've talked about, the Republicans would use the threat of a higher deficit to cut spending. Well, when you cut her client spending, you cut them a dollar, that's a dollar less spending. You cut someone in Medicaid, that's a dollar less spending. So I think there are a lot of ways that this turns out to be anti-wages and anti-growth because you're going to be putting money in the pockets of people who are not likely to spend it or invest it, but to put in their bank account. And the reaction from the Republicans in terms of cutting uh, Medicaid, not having enough for infrastructure, will actually mean less demand, less growth. So if and, I had, and less revenues. Yep. Well, um, so I guess we're saying is a well-designed tax cut in the right place could have some positive dynamic impact. But when you look at this one in the overall context, it's not clear to me that the arrow would be positive at all. Okay. So I have the job of explaining to the people of Florida uh, how I vote on this. And uh, for me to explain what you all just said... Uh, it's going to be hard for me to articulate it and for my folks to understand it. But there is a part of this tax package that I can explain very easily, and I can do it until the cows come home. Mm -hmm. And that is that they are rating Medicare mm -hmm. a, a half a trillion dollars okay. and Medicaid uh, – over a trillion in order to create the revenues to pay for it. So, Max, do you want to comment on what you think that the senior citizens of the United States, will they listen to an argument? Why have you taken money from Medicare and Medicaid and given it to high-income folks in the form of a tax cut? Well, I I've been reading your newsletters, and your, I'm on your list, so I get all the stuff you put out. And, <clears throat> and you're, doing <clears throat> you're doing a pretty good job of, uh, of explaining it uh, up, up until, until this point. Um, you know, Democrats lost uh, senior vote the last uh, three or four cycles. And uh, I think part of that was because, well, the Affordable Care Act, and uh, the myths that were uh, out there about all the money that was uh, stolen or taken from the Medicare program. You remember all that, $800 billion uh, taken from Medicare when the truth was money was saved out of the Medicare program from providers, not from beneficiaries. And that money, for a lot of that money, was plowed back into the Medicare program. And you had improved benefits, you had preventative treatments, uh, I talked about that when I was in uh, your state uh, with you in, in Michigan, and, and all of the benefits, uh, diabetes screening, colonoscopy, mammograms, expanding the solvency of Medicare program. So those lies worked in terms of uh, getting the senior vote to vote the, against their best interests. Mm -hmm. So it, it is not easy to, uh, to explain uh, what is going on and what, what maybe works is to look back historically and what happened uh, with the Bush tax cuts. Now, when, when Gene uh, and was in the White House the last year, you had a surplus, right, Gene? And people were wondering, you know, what are we going to do with this surplus? They were worried about the surplus being too big, if I remember uh, correctly. And then uh, we had the, uh, the Bush tax cuts, which... Uh, in a few years blew a big hole in the deficit. And, and what happened then was the effort to privatize Social Security, to save, to get that money somehow. And I remember, I remember so well the day, uh, the day after President Bush was reelected and we were in our boardroom, he came out to have his press conference and he said, I've earned political capital in this campaign. I'm gonna use it to privatize Social Security. That was the first thing he was going to do with his political capital. And he barnstormed the country, 30 town hall meetings in 30 days, and we followed him as best we could. We didn't have our first one. It took us a little longer to get to some of these places, and we used the media. Mm -hmm. And that effort collapsed. But it was, uh, 
It was a, a very focused effort to defeat that by members of uh, Democrats in the House and the Senate and a lot of the advocacy groups. So it can be done, it has been done, and it takes a lot of cooperation with uh, the members and uh, some of the advocate groups. Thank you very much. And now, uh, uh, Senator Warren, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I begin, I just want to say thank you very much to Luz Alfarela for being here. Thank you for coming down from Boston. And uh, more importantly, thank you for the work that you do every day for the financial well-being and security of families in Massachusetts. It makes a big difference. It's such a pleasure to have you all oh, here in this body <laughs> representing you. us. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for doing this, Senator Stabenow, for putting this together. Here I am. I'm in cleanup position. Uh, so with us in the uh, seventh game of the World Series, uh, my job is to pull some of this together. Uh, you know, President Trump and the Republicans have made some pretty amazing claims about what their tax plan would do. And I'm just going to quote some of these. They've said it will create millions of new jobs, more money for middle class Americans, uh, paid for with economic growth, these are all direct quotes, basically free ice cream for everyone. No, that last one was me. Uh, but I think that's the right summary here. Uh, as we know, these are not new ideas. We've seen these ideas before, and one reason we wanted to be here today is to talk about the experience in Kansas, because we know that Kansas tried it. That in 2012, Kansas Republicans, led by Republican Governor Sam Brownback, enacted a massive partisan tax cut that cut taxes for the richest Kansans and created a huge loophole for people who could afford to hire lawyers and shield them from paying a fair share of their taxes. And exactly what the Republicans in Washington are trying to do now for the whole country. So Mr. Ward, you were serving in the Kansas House of Representatives when the tax plan was pushed through. And before we talk about what the plan did, I want to start, can you tell us what Governor Brownback and other Repo Republicans in your state promised that the tax plan was going to do? Thank you, Senator. Yes, um, the governor and all of the, uh, the only thing I would say, there was a good group of Republicans that were moderates who, who joined with moderate Democrats and posed. We just didn't have the numbers. And that's one advantage you have. You have more numbers than we did that year. They all said exactly, <laughs> those quotes could have came out of Sam Brownback's mouth in 2012. Those quotes could have came out of Richard Carlson, who was the chair of our tax committee and carried this bill on the House floor's mouth. Governor Brownback went one step further because he likes um, colorful language. He said that these tax cuts would be an adrenaline shot to the heart of the Kansas economy. And then he followed it up or doubled down by saying not only will that happen in an economic growth, you'll get 25,000 new jobs in four years. Okay, so 25,000 new jobs in four years is going to boost job growth, pay for itself, right? Am I right? That's it. Boost investment, increase economic growth, all the parts. You know, it sounds like a lot like what we're hearing right now from President Trump and the congressional Republicans about their plan, which actually shouldn't be a surprise because, after all, the billionaire Koch brothers were behind the Kansas tax plan, and now they're throwing around tens of millions of dollars to push this new Republican plan nationally. But one of the most important promises that Republicans made was that it was going to help working families and create jobs. So, Mr. Ward, after the Republican tax plan took effect in Kansas, how did your state's job growth compare to the United States as a whole? We were much below the national average of job creation over the four years of the tax experiment. Yeah, actually, I, I have here that you were 48 out of 50. Yes. All right, 48 out of 50 in And Kansas don't growth. like being 48 of anything. Okay, all right, I got it, I got it. And how did you compare with neighboring states? I want to know if there was just a regional problem. No, um, we're, we're touched by Oklahoma, Colorado, Nebraska, and Missouri. We tended to finish fifth, and we really don't like finishing fifth to those four states. Fifth out of five. Okay. Not that Got they're it. not wonderful states, but we're competitive in Kansas. Okay. So the, tans, the Kansas tax cut experiment 
totally failed at creating jobs, as the Republicans had promised. So let's talk now for just a second about what it did do. Mr. Ward, how did this tax plan affect schools in Kansas? Thank you, sir. In Kansas, we spend 50 cents of every tax dollar on pre-K through 12 education. We spend another 20 cents on our higher ed program, junior colleges, community colleges, and our border regents colleges. Um, we um, Today, as we sit here, we're still about 1,500 teachers short from a full staff. Wow. Teachers are not choosing Kansas to make their careers. We have two larger class sizes. We've lost programs that impact those children that are challenged. We had school districts that had to cut the number of days a week to meet their budget. Because when you pay for these kind of tax cuts, which the um, economists in this panel have talked about, there have to be pay fors one way or the other. And yep. Sam Brownback made the largest single tax cut I'm not tax cut. Well, he did that too. But the largest cut to public schools in Kansas came under Governor Brownback in his first year of the tax plan because the hole, the deficit created was so large, he had to fill it. And you, you mentioned about K-12, about schools being closed, I understand, in small towns, teachers. You've got all of these teacher vacancies now, teachers that were laid off, days that were shortened for the school year. What about for higher ed? What happened to higher ed in Kansas? That's even more disturbing because it's becoming too expensive for our kids to go. and They're delaying those kinds of decisions because when the state doesn't make investments, universities turn to tuition and fees and, and a good colorful when I went to school many many years ago in the 70s the state of Kansas I only paid for about 25 percent of my education through tuition today that's way up over 60 percent 55 percent and the universities are struggling to keep it affordable the community colleges are struggling to keep it affordable. there are some incredibly creative Cali County is doing an incredibly creative way there are hundreds of examples of that, but it's still becoming too, much too expensive. And I, that's what happens, when I suppose, when you cut tens of millions of dollars out of your higher ed programs. So I, I appreciate your coming here and talking about this, Mr. Ward. You know, the Kansas tax cut experiment was great for millionaires and billionaires, but for everyone else, it was a total failure, a failure for workers, a failure for middle class families, a failure for kids. It was such a failure that five years after enacting these tax cuts, Kansas Republicans passed a law to reverse it. And if the Republicans in Washington want to do to America what they did to Kansas, then we know exactly where this goes. We've now seen the movie and we know how it ends. The Republican tax plan is just a way for the rich to get richer and everyone else to fall further behind. It is that simple. Working families in this country face terrible challenges. Wages that are too low, expenses for health care and housing and education costs that are too high. And what are the Republicans doing about it? What is their plan? They're peddling the same snake oil that they sold in Kansas just so they can maximize payoffs to their corporate donors. You know, we need to fight this Republican tax plan because our kids' futures depend on it. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Warren. And thank you to everyone for coming today. This has been uh, really helpful, I think a really important discussion, and to everyone who's been joining with us on Facebook Live as well. You know, listening uh, today and thinking about Halloween yesterday, I have to remember a friend of mine said that Washington Republicans celebrated Halloween by giving all the candy to 1% of the kids and hoping they would share it with everybody else. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Um, but. In all seriousness, we need to be focused on jobs, and we need to be focused on economic opportunity. Uh, that's what we need. That's what Americans need and deserve, and that's how we uh, grow the economy. And it's clear from all of your testimony today in our discussion that the Republican tax giveaway to the richest Americans will not achieve that goal. We believe Americans deserve a better deal, and that's what we're focused on. Thank you very much.